So uh, my uh, talk today is on uh, tourism in Revelstoke, and uh, David came in. He asked me uh, who was the first tourist in Revelstoke. So um, I'm never. Uh, I'm always a little reluctant to answer any questions. <laughs> the first, uh, biggest, the oldest. Uh, uh, Things like that, but uh, I think the um, I can definitely can't answer that question definitively. But I think it's pretty clear that the first uh, tourists that came here were coming to climb. They were coming because of uh, of uh, Glacier National Park, which was uh, proclaimed a national park in 1886. It was uh, uh, Banff had been proclaimed the, the previous year. And that was really as a result of the railway construction and people coming into the mountains and real, uh, realizing what a treasure it was here. Um, the um, first really uh, recorded um, climbs that we're aware of were uh, climbed by, um, climbs by uh, William Spotswood Green and his partner Reverend Henry Swansea in 1888. And uh, they produced a book called Among the Selkirk uh, Glaciers. And uh, I think, um, you know, we can definitely call them amongst the earliest, uh, earliest tourists in Revelstoke and definitely amongst the earliest mountaineers in the Selkirks. Uh, so um, the, the focus of the, of the climbing in, uh, in the Selkirks was really based at Glacier House which was a um, hotel built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, starting in the late 1880s, it started with a small building uh, for, to, so that they could feed passengers because of the, the length of time it took to get the trains through the, through the loops, through, the, the, through the, the Rogers Pass. Uh, they were finding that they were having to sort of stop, uh, stop the passengers uh, in that area and so they started out with just little train cars where they could feed passengers and it turned into a, a larger tea house and then people were just so uh, amazed by the, the glacier, uh, by the mountains there that uh, they wanted the, to be able to stay there. So eventually the CPR built this as part of their chain of hotels that they were building across the, across the country. And um, up until, you know, it probably was uh, expanded several times until about uh, 1913. And um, this, in every season, they would have more than 1,000 people coming there, which is a very significant amount of, of tourism. And at that time, the, the, the glacier was uh, only about a 20-minute walk. The base of the Ilosolo Glacier would only have been a 20-minute walk from Glacier House. Uh, that's an idea of, uh, gives you an idea of how much the glacier has receded over the last 125 years. Uh, it's about it, two hours to walk there now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a huge difference. So it was a real draw for people to be able to get easily into the middle of the mountains and to be able to climb easily to get to, to, to a glacier that easily. Uh, so it became a, a real draw and definitely for the, the seat of mountain climbing in the, in the Selkirks. And um, then eventually they uh, brought over uh, Swiss guides. These are uh, from the collection of the Foyt's uh, family who were uh, uh, guides that came, were brought over by the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, from Switzerland. So the, the Canadian Pacific Railway was actually really instrumental in starting tourism in the West uh, because they, they uh, wanted to encourage people to, to come to travel on the railway. Uh, they had a real had an had an interest in promoting tourism in the region. So I think it's safe to say that they were really uh, that it was it was the CPR that really started uh, looking at this area as a draw for, for tourists. Um, I know we think of uh, now as tour, as Revelstoke being a recent tourist town. Hi, come on in. Yeah, we'll just grab a couple of more chairs for you. There's one right in the middle. There's one there, and then uh, Holly's just going to find a couple more. Okay. 
region. Uh, so as we were saying, we think of tourism as, as a more uh, recent industry in Revelstoke, but uh, the early residents were really conscious of uh, encouraging people to come into this area, and they were conscious of uh, advertising the, the, the tourism potential of the area. Uh, there was a 1903 uh, special Christmas edition of the Kootenai Mail that had uh, probably about um, 40 pages and it included lots of photographs and they had a section in there on uh, tourism in Revelstoke and it said, um, as a tourist resort, Revelstoke and the surrounding, surrounding scenery cannot be excelled. To the west are the Sycamus Lakes with their arms stretching far into the mountain gorges, their shores frequented by deer, bear, mountain lions, etc. The waters teem with fish, affording the choicest of sport for the angler. At Clan William, there's excellent hunting and fishing, and Clan William is just uh, west of here, in uh, the Summit Lake area. It also mentioned uh, Groundhog and Standard Basin uh, for exploration and mountain climbing never yet, yet, never yet traversed. So in 1903, there were still a lot of, uh, of um, areas that hadn't been climbed. So uh, for people wanting to do uh, first summits, there was a lot of uh, possibility there too. Um, they talked about the, the Arrow Lakes and um, Halcyon Hot Springs, which of course, and Halcyon Hot Springs is still there now. Uh, it's in a different location because of course the, the when the dam was put in at Castlegar, it changed the water level. So uh, the current Halcyon Hot Springs is not the same facility, but it's in the, the same basic area. Uh, so Halcyon Hot Springs had been developed in the, the 1890s. So, uh, and it uh, was there until like, the 1950s when it, uh, late, late 50s when it burned down. Uh, so it was uh, a, big, uh, a big draw. For many years it was also, um, uh, they had, uh, they said that the waters had uh, uh, curative powers. Uh, some of the, we actually have a bottle from um, Halcyon Hot Springs where they were bottling the water and it uh, said that there was a uh, high content of lithium in the, uh, in the water, so. Uh, this if you're, uh, if you have uh, bipolar disorder. <laughs> there was another hotel too, wasn't there? Yes, there was St. Leon. St. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, St. Leon was uh, just a little bit, uh, uh, it was down in that, uh, in that same area. And uh, that resort was there from also from the 1890s up until uh, the 1960s when they uh, had to clear the area for the, uh, the dam at Castlegar. So those were some of, you know, some very specific tourist draws in the area. Uh, it, uh, this uh, 1903 newspaper also says there are Il Solit Valley with the famous Albert Canyon and its hot springs. The national parks at Glacier and Rogers Pass, which are a paradise to the mountaineer. And uh, again, they talked about uh, Glacier House and the, uh, the Swiss Guides. Um, in uh, 1905, there was a Revelstoke Tourist Association was formed to find ways to encourage tourists to visit the area. And, uh, and they produced a, a brochure. Uh, they also built a trail to the upper portion of the falls on Eight Mile Creek. And the, um, the, this was uh, Eight Mile Creek, and it was renamed, uh, the falls were renamed Silvertip Falls. They had a little contest in about 1908 to come up with a, with a more attractive name for the falls instead of just Eight Mile. So, of course, you know, Silvertip is uh, the, the grizzly, grizzly bears in the area. And it was a very popular picnic spot. It was a reasonable walking distance from town. 
and uh, they uh, were also um, at that time investigating the possibility of constructing a trail to the summit of Mount Revelstoke and there was a trail that was built in 1908 to the summit, a walking trail that was known as the Lindmark Trail. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, if you look on maps of Mount Revelstoke now, uh, the Lindmark Trail is, a little, is more on the eastern boundaries of the, or the western boundaries of the park, whereas the, uh, the trail that's now referred to as Summit Trail we believe that was the actual Lindmark Trail. And at some point, I haven't figured out when yet, at some point, uh, somebody switched the names. I guess they felt that the, that the Summit Trail was, um, was a better name for the direct trail. And uh, probably at, no, at that time, nobody knew how, who the heck Lindmark was anyway. So uh, they kind of relegated to the, to the farther trail. Uh, but Lindmark was the mayor at, in 1908 at the time that they built the trail. So he got, he got a trail named after him. Um, this was a, a tourist brochure that uh, was produced um, around 1907 or 1908, as close as I can tell based on the, the content in, in it. And uh, you know, it, it's interesting to see that there's, you know, now the uh, the tourist um, uh, they try to be the tourist promotion. They try to be really have really clear messaging. This one has like three um, like two different slogans on it. Uh, Revel said the tourist center of the West and the Switzerland of America. And then they've also got another, another little line down there reached by the Canadian Pacific Railway. So this was actually produced by Sibbledon Field, who were uh, real estate and commission agents in Revelstoke. And uh, here's some of the uh, wording from there. And of course, in the style of the day, everything was very wordy. You know, now we expect uh, to things to be way more graphic and very few words. They, they did not spare the words back then. <laughs> so here's a little bit from the beginning. In these days of the strenuous life, when, nature's demands, uh, when nature demands rest and recreation to enable the mind and body to withstand the strain, the question is often asked, where should I go for a holiday? The writer of this booklet has traveled much and would answer, to Revelstoke. <laughs> <laughs> A great Alpine authority described this country as 50 or 60 Switzerlands rolled into one. <laughs> and they uh, really encouraged uh, mountaineering, hunting, and, and fishing. Um, other than the, the Glacier House and the uh, resorts at uh, Halcyon on St. Leon, there weren't a lot of specific you know, tourist draws in here. It was, they were really, uh, it was the, the nature, nature itself that was the draw. That's what they were encouraging people to, uh, to come for. Uh, it said, from Revelstoke, uh, trips can be arranged into the heart of the big game country. Reliable guides, saddle and pack horses, and full camping outfits can be secured in the city. Several stores supply souvenir books and postcards illustrating the scenery of the surrounding country. Um, and it said, one of the finest holiday trips that can be obtained is that by the steamer Revelstoke into the heart of the Big Bend. Four miles above the city, the steamer enters the Columbia River Canyon, one of the grandest scenes to be found in inland navigable waters. The pretty little steamer, which makes the trip, seems, for the nonce, walled in by rocks on every side, their horizon canopied by beautiful trees, fir, cedar, and hemlock. Uh, so they were encouraging, they, uh, the, the Revelstoke could take passengers, so they were encouraging people to book a, a little steamer tour on the, on the SS Revelstoke. It also mentions the uh, Nakamu Caves, which were discovered in uh, 19, about 1905 in um, Glacier National Park. And um, it, uh, it, the, over the years, they discovered more and more uh, the extent of the caves. So, but uh, there were, there was unrestricted access to the caves in the early days. They had a uh, national uh, park uh, uh, guide, uh, originally Mr. Deutschman, and then uh, later another man who would take people into the caves. And then they even built a tea house at the entrance to the caves. Uh, where people could uh, stop and have their tea before or after they, they descended into the cave system. Uh, the caves were eventually uh, closed to the public and now are open only by restricted uh, access to the, 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 the 
uh, to direct uh, application to the parks for, for access now. But at one time that was definitely a, a tourist draw. Um, just going to backtrack a bit to talking about um, the Glacier House. Of course, Glacier House doesn't exist any longer. It was actually torn down by the CPR in the 1920s. After the First World War, the CPR was um, uh, getting rid of some of their uh, less uh, profitable uh, ventures. And uh, once they had put, uh, opened the Connaught Tunnel in uh, Rogers Pass, it bypassed uh, the Glacier House. And they could still get people in there by horse and cart, but it wasn't as big of a draw as it had been. And as I say, they were starting to close some of their less profitable businesses, so it was torn down in uh, the 1920s. But you can still get into the, the area and see the uh, see the footprint of the buildings. You can see some of the, the where where the buildings were. And it's definitely uh, definitely worthwhile going in there. It's really a, amazing when you walk into this wilderness and imagine this huge hotel, that huge hotel system uh, in that area in the 18, back in the early 1900s. Um, I also uh, find this really interesting. A lot of the early tourism uh, brochures um, and tourism promotions really pushed the point that Revelstoke was one of the easiest spots in, to reach in North America. <laughs> yeah, we find that quite funny. Uh, but there were nine passenger trains in uh, passing through the mainland of the CPR in 1910 and rail and steamer connections south into the United States. So it was the only, really the only way to easily cross the country at that time. So uh, yeah, they... Do you know how many passenger trains a day would go through here? Uh, they said uh, nine. A day? Yes. It comes east and west. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, at, at, at the height, that was, they would have up to, they'd have up to nine, okay. nine passenger trains. And you know what um, in uh, 19, uh, oh, before I get to this one, um, I found this e extremely hokey little editorial in the Mail Herald newspaper in June 26, 1912. And I'll read it in my most dramatic voice. <laughs> it's called Come to Revelstoke. Come to the city of Revelstoke. Come to the city of romance and beauty. Come to the land of mirth and music, and the home of song and story. Come to the deathbed of melancholy and the graveyard of care. Come to the land of golden sunshine. Come to the land of the cedar and pine. Come to the land of crystal streams and the frisky trout comedians. <laughs> Come to the land of fragrant wildflowers drooping on a thousand hills and timid violets blushing in a thousand bells. Come to the land of snow-capped mountains. Come to the land of grim old canyons, wooded hillsides, and lightning-footed deer. Come to the land of winding trails, the romance and the glory that cling to the relics of frontier life. Come to the Alps of America, of which every tongue on earth shall speak. <laughs> Come to the mightiest exhibit of nature's artist. Come to the city of destiny. Come to the men and women who have watered it with their tears and blessed it with their smile. Come to the campfires of hospitality that are awaiting you. Come to Revelstoke with her open, throbbing heart. Come to the spirit that bids you welcome. Come. But this was quite hilarious. Um, but in 1912, there was really uh, a new push to uh, promote the area. There was a group formed called uh, the Progress Club that was formed as sort of an adjunct to the, to the Revelstoke Board of Trade. Uh, the, one of the men, Mr. McLennan, who was proposing the Progress Club said, we shall have to get the public generally to buck with us instead of bucking against us, as is too often the case in Revelstoke. Uh, so they, they formed uh, this club. They had uh, they were going to have it in the uh, city hall, but they had to move it over to Selkirk Hall because they had 150 people who showed up uh, to this meeting. And uh, they, uh, so they had 123 people who immediately subscribed 
as members of the Progress Club, each paying a, a dollar to join. And uh, one of the men who spoke, uh, was Robert Gordon, said, we have relied upon the businessmen too much and left to the Board of Trade and the City Council the duties which every one of us as citizens should be willing and anxious to perform for the good of Revelstoke in the matter of preparing it for the great growth which is now ahead of us. Uh, so they, uh, they formed uh, this, uh, this committee and uh, one of the first things that they wanted to do was uh, to uh, meet with their uh, member of parliament and um, they also the member of the legislature, so that would be Thomas Taylor and Robert Green. And they wanted to talk to them about the possibility of building a road to the summit of Mount Revelstoke and also about the possibility of having Mount Revelstoke uh, proclaimed as a, a national park reserve. So it was really the Progress Club that got those, uh, those initiatives underway. And they, uh, they were actually, they started uh, the road construction before, the, the, uh, before it was proclaimed a park. So it was, uh, the Mount Revelstoke National Park was proclaimed in 1914. And they had a big ceremony in the summer of 1912 to uh, start the, the um, building of the road. And they very optimistically uh, felt that the road could be completed by the end of the following summer, so by the end of 1913. Uh, they were off by a few years. It was opened in 1927. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that they uh, decided to do was, uh, well, here's the, the aims and uh, objectives of the Progress Club. To foster the pride of the citizens in their home city and district to acquaint the general public with the extent of the vast natural resources in the way of timber, minerals, land, water, and water routes tributary to the city, and to give every possible aid to any legitimate plans for the development of these resources. To familiarize the citizens and the general public with the unsurpassed scenic attractions surrounding Revelstoke, and to make these attractions easily available by means of good roads and trails and to build up the city by encourage, encouraging the citizens to patronize home industries, trade with their home merchants, and invest their money in Revelstoke and vicinity. And even then they were talking about shop local, but the big competition back then would have been the Eaton's catalog <laughs> rather than Kelowna, because there was nothing in Kelowna. Um, they were also really pushing that uh, a uh, golf course be built on the top of Mount Revelstoke as well. That was another one of their initiatives that uh, that one didn't fly. <laughs> uh, but another thing that they did was they had a contest to select a slogan for the city. And the slogan that was selected was the capital of Canada's Alps. And that was proposed by B.R. Atkins who had uh, come to Revelstoke originally in the 1890s as a newspaper editor and then was involved in uh, government uh, work, and he did a lot of early writing uh, in the Revelstoke, um, history of Revelstoke as well. But uh, he won five dollars for his uh, slogan. Uh, but I can understand why he won, because here's the other suggestions. <laughs> Revelstoke, the mountain magnet. <laughs> the rocky scenic city. Of course, we're not even in the rocky. Uh, three R's, railways, rivers, and resources and the golden best of the golden west, which might have been fine if they were trying to promote golden. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, B.R. Atkins won with Revelstoke, the capital of Canada's Alps, and that was used on the masthead of the local newspaper for several years. And they also even created this lighted sign that was strung across uh, Mackenzie Avenue. Um, that would be in the, the where you can see the sign. Uh, hardware there, that's the, now the Roxy, so it was in that uh, strung across that first block. The capital of Canada's Alps welcomes you. And the other slogans that have been used, it were used in the early days were the Switzerland of America and Mountain Paradise. And in fact, we have some t-shirts in the gift shop downstairs which have a picture of a skier and the slogan Mountain Paradise. And and of course, uh, the development of Mount Revelstoke, the locals really saw that as a huge draw for tourists. Uh, this was uh, the chalet that was built by the Mountaineering Club, in, uh, originally built in 1909. 
Uh, of course, a lot of locals went up. Once the road was built, there were a lot of any tourists that came into the area were really encouraged to, to go up. And the newspaper would actually even give a list of people who had gone up uh, on, uh, to, to see the, the, the mountain. This picture would have been taken about 1930. The road, as I said, was opened in 1927. Um, here's another um, editorial from the January 3rd, 1918 issue of the Revelstoke Review entitled Revelstoke, a Winter Resort. Revelstoke is fortunate in having the three chief assets which comprise a popular winter resort. First, the snow conditions are suitable for winter sport, skiing, tobogganing, and snowshoeing. Second, the topography of the surrounding country is ideal. In its hills, the ski runner can find a wide range and variety of grades, anywhere from the slow gradient for the novice to the whirlwind 100 mile an hour dash of the expert. Third, its location midway between Calgary and Vancouver on the main line of travel makes it the easiest accessible place in the province. Again, that easy to get here. <laughs> Uh, with all these natural advantages, it would be a dead town which would not grasp the opportunity of developing this sport. And of course, by then, the uh, Revelstoke uh, Ski Club had uh, started uh, holding competitions. Uh, the, their first competition was held in 1915, and then in 1916, 100 years ago, earlier this month, they held the, the first ski jumping competition on Mount Revelstoke within the National Park boundaries. Uh, there's uh, Revelstoke Mountain Paradise of British Columbia. That brochure would probably be around the 1930s. Um, so another one of uh, the, another sort of important moment in uh, promotion of Revelstoke was when they, uh, the first, the roads built in this area. The uh, highway from Revelstoke to Sycamus was opened in 1922, in August of 1922. And September of 1922, they had the first fatality on the trans the high work between here and Sycamus when a uh, driver was uh, going too fast around Summit Lake and uh, went into the into Summit Lake, and I think and that would have been the first uh, car accident in Summit Lake with an un unrecovered body. So there was uh, the man who was driving was Donald Adams, and he had his uh, his fiance Lida Steed and her parents and the uh, matron of the hospital. And the matron of the hospital and Mrs. Steed uh, both, uh, both drowned and uh, what, at least one of the bodies was never recovered. Uh, but that's definitely also part of the tour is the story here is the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, treacherous roads and that, as they say, from the moment they opened the road, that was an issue. Uh, but it wasn't until um, 1940 that the Big Bend Highway was opened, which uh, allowed uh, traffic, uh, uh, auto traffic from here to Golden. Before that, you could only, the only way you could get from here to Golden was by rail. And uh, there were people that were trying to uh, travel, trying to drive across the country, and their choices were either to go south into the U.S. and then back into Canada, or to have their car put on the rails at uh, Golden and uh, uh, by delivered by rail to Revelstoke, where they could continue their journey. Uh, but this is a brochure that was put out once the uh, Big Bend <coughs> Highway was uh, completed. The uh, it actually started uh, construction in uh, 19, 1927, 1929, but they didn't complete uh, the highway until 1940. And of course, part of that was because uh, of the, the Great Depression and uh, the difficulty. In, uh, in in doing road work with uh, uh, such a, a such a poor economy, but um, once it was um, it was opened, the locals were really aware that that was a chance for them to promote the, the community, and uh, that's when uh, uh, Earl uh, Dickey, who uh, was um, he was actually worked for the city of Revelstoke as their electrical superintendent. He was also the publicity chairman for the board of trade. So he put a lot of effort into photographing the area. He felt that there weren't sufficient uh, good publicity photographs. So he spent a lot of time doing photographs in the area and uh, really promoting this area. He became a stringer for the uh, Vancouver newspapers as well. So he was making sure that 
news stories were getting into the Vancouver newspapers. Uh, so this was the, uh, the bro one of the brochures that was produced after the Big Bend Highway was open. And uh, all of these photographs were taken by Earl Dickey. Mentions the, uh, the golf course there, which had opened in 1924. Uh, there's a, a map of the area. Uh, there's a photograph that Earl Dickey took of showing some of the spectacular scenery on the highway. And of course, uh, Woodenhead was a real draw. Uh, people definitely knew they were on the Big Bend Highway when they saw the Woodenhead had a sign beside it that said, don't be wooden-headed, drive carefully, you live to enjoy the, the scenery. <laughs> and uh, Woodenhead was created uh, when they were building the Big Bend Highway. One of the uh, men who was working on the highway, Peter Fiocco, saw the stump that he thought looked an awful lot like a head, so he um, made it look even more like a head. <laughs> and uh, they decided, his foreman decided that it would be a really good idea to put it right beside the bridge at uh, the, the top of the, at the boat encampment at the, the top of end of the Big Bend. So it stood there until uh, 1962 as a warning for people to, to drive slower. And uh, when they uh, opened the Rogers Pass uh, Highway in 1962, they moved uh, Woodenhead down to this area. And now he has a little home in Woodenhead Park. <laughs> uh, this is a photograph of Goldstream Falls on the, the Big Bend Highway, an and uh, example of the spectacular scenery in the area. Um, the, uh, also, in um, one of the things that the Board of Trade uh, did to encourage people to visit the area was they had a uh, personal tourists campaign from Revelstoke. So they encouraged everybody when they were sending out their Christmas cards uh, in uh, 1941 to uh, send a personal invitation to everybody they were sending a card to to, to come and visit Revelstoke. Uh, it said, um, they uh, organized a letter writing week during which everyone wrote to a relative or friend in the United States recommending a holiday to Canada this year. Even the Revelstoke school children took pen in hand and sent letters to their cousins and chums across the border, inviting them to come north. So uh, they took, you know, really taking drastic action to encourage people to come here. Um, the um, Golden Spike Days was a venture of the um, that the local uh, Kinsman Club put on to uh, encourage people to come to Revelstoke and to really provide um, you know, a celebration. So they ha started the first one in 1944, and uh, everybody dressed up in uh, sort of old, old-fashioned clothes. There was an elderly lady who had a little store on uh, First Street West that she'd had since the early 1900s, and I don't think she'd ever brought in new stock. <laughs> so everybody bought her stock of her despite things because she had exactly what they were looking for. She had the, you know, the old-fashioned hat, she had chaps, you know, spats, and everything they needed. So um, that, that pretty well decimated her stock. Um, they uh, did a reenactment of the driving of the last fight, so they were really uh, building on the, the railway history of the area. And uh, it was successful too. They after they ran that for several years up until uh, the early '60s, and it uh, did bring people into town. I was wondering where that picture is. This picture was taken just down. Uh, this was where Government Road used to go through. Um, now Government Road is um, so. This is First Street. This would be the um, brewery. Brewery. the brewery. And the cenotaph has been was moved a little bit farther over here. The hospital would be over on this on this side of the street. But the, that was a government road that angled through there at that time. Uh, the last vestige of government road is where the Lord Co Auto Parts is now. And uh, one of the other things that happened uh, during the uh, uh, Golden Spike Days was this uh, flotilla uh, that uh, was organized uh, from the United States. And they first came up in 1945. I found a, an article from the Spokane Spokesman Review from January 7th, 1946. 
said this year, marking the centennial of settlement of the Oregon boundary, uh, is to be celebrated in the Inland Empire by popularization of a remarkable 600-mile boat trip under two flags. A pioneer flotilla of 15 motorboats and speedboats made the trip last summer as a pathfinding party with 60 participants. And uh, so that was organized uh, through uh, uh, a fellow in Washington State along with uh, Earl Dickey in uh, Revelstoke. So they had this big flotilla of, uh, of boats coming up from the, from the states. Let's just show a few of the boats. And of course, the Tournament of Champions was a, a huge draw for many, many years. As I said, the first uh, jumps took place in Mount Revelstoke uh, in 1916. And by the 1920s, uh, Revelstoke was really seen as uh, sort of the place to come to witness uh, first class uh, ski jumping events. And of course, Nels Nelson was the, the ski hero at that time. Uh, the um, events continued into the 1960s and got bigger and bigger. And they would have, they had huge uh, uh, international competitions referred to as the Tournament of Champions. And um, a lot of people did come in to, to watch the events. And the CPR would even bring in special cars that they would uh, spot on the track so that uh, people could actually stay in a rail car while they uh, were here for the events. And it uh, would get good press coverage from, uh, from all over as well. So it, that was a major, major winter draw. Of course, the uh, uh, <coughs> Trans Canada Highway was uh, built in 1962. They were completed in 1962. The, um, the Trans Canada Bridge at Revelstoke opened in the summer of 1961, and then uh, the official federal opening of the highway was on September 3rd, 1962. There were actually two openings. There was a provincial opening and a federal opening, but um, you can see there was a, a huge amount of people uh, that uh, came in for that. Um, I um, ended up not being in here. Um, there was a, I found a, a note that uh, when they, um, when they opened the, the highway in uh, 1962, I found an article from a Vancouver newspaper which was uh, really criticizing uh, all of the towns along the highway and saying that they weren't ready for the uh, influx of people, that they were dirty and uh, you know, run down. Um, they didn't have any facilities. Uh, they talked about their uh, the uh, about the um, one hotel, one new hotel in Revelstoke, which was the McGregor's, now Powder Springs. Uh, that it uh, that there wasn't accommodation to uh, accommodate all of the new travelers that were coming through here, and that uh, they felt that the communities had to address that quickly if they weren't just going to lose all these thousands of people. Uh, that were that were going through here. Uh, they were talking about one couple from Florida who had driven into town and had been able to stay at uh, McGregor's, but uh, the restaurant wasn't open as early as they wanted it to, uh, to be in, in the morning for their breakfast. So they went to what was described as a greasy diner, and they were less than impressed. So uh, there was a, that little cautionary tale that the community had to really step up its game if they wanted to. I get the, the encourage people to stay once they were able to get through here on the highway. So showing the West Gate on the Rogers Pass Highway. Uh, there's some pictures from beautiful British Columbia magazine of the BC opening. And that that plaque is uh, is that just in it. Is that inside the... Yeah, it's, the, it's, it was the moved to the West Welcome area at Mount Rubblestoke. So if you're driving on the highway, Shannon, you can, as you're driving on the highway, um, it's on the right-hand side, just at the West Welcome. Mm -hmm. How many miles are these on? Do you know? It's not very many. It's sort of the like first pull out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not the first pull out. Yeah. yeah. And they had a, a big um, a beef dinner up at the, the, at the high school. So they were, you can see them serving dinner for thousands of people. 
Um, so there's the McGregor's Motor Inn on, uh, this is their uh, Second Street West, or yeah, Second Street West side, and uh, that's now the Powder Springs. That was uh, where they had a, had a swimming pool there, which is now their summer outdoor patio. And then the Alpine Inn was also built in 1962, <coughs> by the Zernaitis family. And then uh, shortly after that, the Northlander Hotel was built <coughs> at Rogers Pass. And we won't talk about the sad story of the Northlander Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Thank you. <laughs> um, then, of course, east of town, there was the um, uh, Three Valley Gap that started to be developed in uh, the 1960s. And you can see the their original little hotel compared to what's there now. And uh, Enchanted Forest opened in the, the 1950s to the, the Needham family. So that's uh, that's been there a long, long time. And uh, Weird Woods Campground in Smokey the Bear was uh, there in uh, what, the 1960s. And I've forgotten the name of the family that originally owned that. Peter Watts. Peter Watts. Peter Watts. Peter Watts. Okay. And then uh, the Esau's Esau's came. Okay. The Esau's and the A's. Another kind of interesting thing that, that happened in this area was uh, just uh, in the days of uh, Airstream trailers, there was this group of uh, of travelers that would, would do these big caravans of Airstream trailers. They were all Airstream enthusiasts. And there was a guy named Wally Byam from the States who had the Wally Byam caravan and he encouraged all these Airstream trailer owners to uh, travel all together. They'd go all over the States. Uh, this, is, um, um, this is probably in uh, the late, late, later in the 1960s when they were using the Centennial Park uh, they used to use the, the school grounds, like what's now the, the uh, high school and, uh, um, um, and Begbie View school area. They used to use that to, to camp in. Um, when they came here uh, in 1963, found a, a note saying that they had 100 caravans. And uh, they had come here for the first time in 1954. In this, uh, the year 1963, that they had left uh, Minnesota on July 10th and made it to Revelstoke by August 5th. Wow. So they were camping all along the way. And, um, and when they came here, they would usually make a donation to the community. So, and for example, in 1963, they gave a donation of $150 to the Arena Fund. So, um, of course, um, in uh, the 1980s, uh, that's when the downtown revitalization took place. And um, so for people who have, have come here since, you know, we see very pretty downtown. Um, by the 1980s, it was looking a little bit sad. There was an effort in the uh, 1970s to do a revite, but they wanted to use an Alpine theme. That's why Alpine Village Mall is called Alpine Village Mall. Uh, there were some buildings that, that were a little bit alpinized. I actually found, we um, should have put it up here today, um, I actually found a sketch in a newspaper from the early 1970s where they had applied, somebody had done this drawing of City Hall with an alpine <laughs> facade on it, and it's the most god awful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> we can be very, very thankful that that never happened. So they were going to turn this real classic uh, international style building into an alpine travesty. So we're really lucky that that didn't happen. And the Alpine theme didn't fully take off. But in the 1980s, there was money available from the Heritage Trust to restore heritage buildings in downtown cores and, and there was heritage revitalization money available. Yeah. So the town really got on that in a big way. And I think it, it really made all the difference. That's when the band shell was put in and the bricks in the sidewalk and all the, the little uh, heritage style garbage cans and lamp standards. And uh, I think it really did change the nature of the town. It also made, I think it sort of made people uh, aware of the heritage of, of the community because a lot of the downtown uh, buildings had been covered over and you couldn't really see a lot of the heritage features. Uh, for a good example of that is the uh, Padrino's Pizza down the street. 
That was uh, a building that was built in 1902 as a, uh, a men's clothing store. And um, they took, uh, it had been alpinized a little bit. It had, you know, little trims on it. And they took that off, they took the stucco off, and the original wood frame was still there. And in fact, you know, on the side, you could see the original uh, sign on the side that said Fit Reform Warehouse when it was a men's clothing store. And they were able to use photographs in the museum to recreate some of the, the features on the building and bring it back to what it would have looked like originally. So I think that, that was a real good, you know, an important turning point for, for Revelstoke. And I think they really were, uh, those efforts made to really promote Revelstoke as a heritage tourism destination. Uh, for several years, we had the Mountain Arts Festival, which was a really nice uh, community uh, fall festival, really celebrating Revelstoke's uh, cultural side. Um, and then, of course, uh, in more recent years, we've uh, become a full-on resort with the opening of, of Revelstoke Mountain Resort, and you know, that's definitely definitely changed the, the community. But um, it's um, I, I think we, this community has a lot to offer in, in uh, both summer and winter tourism. But uh, I, I think um, it's important not to lose sight of that that heritage and cultural. Uh, offering that we have here. This is a, uh, I think this is a really strong community in uh, the arts and the heritage and culture. And we have to celebrate all of that as well. Remember what the building looked like where the modern cafe is? Yes. That was a new definition of ugly. That was, uh, that was, that was a really good example too, because um, somebody had just put like a pink stucco uh, yeah. square oh, rectangle facade on the front. And uh, when that was uncovered, and when they, they used the photographs to reproduce that, it, it was th that was great because it really does look like uh, like it looked when it was built there. Any other questions or comments? Kathy, I see that the historic sites and monuments board has finally designated the Nels Nelson area as a place of national historic significance. Yes, and I think that's really big. Yes. I, I think the way they, they worded it is it was actually the event of ski jumping on Mount Revelstoke that, of that, <coughs> yes, that, uh, that got the designation. And that's been, I was on a committee probably 10 years ago that was pushing that, and it took that long to get that through, but that is really important for the community. And uh, the building of the Trans Canada Highway was also listed as an event of national significance. So, and of course, we have part of that uh, Trans Canada Highway on our doorstep here. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you.